If there's one video that people keep asking me to make, it is a Black Box 101 video. I have a lot of Black Box videos. I have too many Black Box videos. Too many for anyone to really learn from in a sort of an organized, methodical way. If you just uh, watch all of them, <laughs> maybe you'll pick something up, but I have hundreds of them and who's got time for that? So I'm going to do a series now where I will try to show you in a methodical way Black Box 101 sort of from start to finish. And I don't know where the finish will be. Eventually I'll run out of things to say and I'll call it the end. But I know where I'm going to start and that is starting with the initial setup. Actually, before I start with the setup, let me just make sure that you understand what is Black Box? Uh, if you're watching my channel, I guess that you might already know, but maybe you don't, right? Black Box is a tool that lets you see what's going on inside your flight controller. And it's great for tuning and it's great for troubleshooting. So if you're the kind of person who's excited by little lines and squiggles that show you the underlying working of the flight controller, this is for you. And if you're the kind of person who wants a deeper insight into how tuning works, I learned a lot of what I know about tuning by looking at what the PIDs do in Black Box and thinking about how that correlates to what my copter is doing in the air. Setting up Black Box, getting started with Black Box is a lot easier than it once was. One of the things you're going to need is this tool that I've got on screen right now, the Betaflight Black Box Explorer. And this is a tool that is going to open up the log files that you download from your flight controller and let you analyze them, let you look at all the little squiggles and wiggles and lines and figure out what was going on inside your flight controller. This is the Betaflight Black Box Explorer. This is the one you want. It's a Chrome app. You're going to need to download and install Chrome if you want to use it. If you're one of the people out there who objects to Chrome because Google is evil and they're spying on you and etc., then you're out of luck. The Chrome app is the only way to do it that I'm aware of. There is another Black Box Explorer app, which is the Clean Flight Black Box Explorer. That is not the one that you want. This one is basically out of date. I'm not sure. When was the last time it was updated? Does it say September 19th, 2016? That's actually not that long ago. But the, the Betaflight folks have been kicking butt on developing the, uh, the, the Betaflight Black Box Explorer. And it has a ton of features, a ton of features that the Clean Flight one doesn't. I mean, maybe the Clean Flight one does. I wouldn't know. I switched over to the Betaflight one and I never looked back. So you're going to want the Betaflight Black Box Explorer, say that three times fast, installed in Chrome. And then here inside your flight controller, you're going to need to configure it to use Black Box. Now, that assumes that you have some way of recording the Black Box data. And if we go first, let's go to the configuration tab. You're going to need to have the Black Box feature enabled. And then here in the Black Box tab, you're going to need to select where you are logging to. And you may have several selections here. Now, in my case, I have the selection for an onboard SD card slot. And that's because the board I have plugged in right now is an Omnibus F3. It has an SD card slot on it. All I have to do is insert an SD card into that slot and away I go. Now, you can see right here I've got no card inserted, but stick a card in and we should be good to go. You can also log to a serial port. And what that means is you'll have an open log device. So this is a little device. You insert an SD card right here and you wire it up to one of the serial ports on your flight controller and the flight controller dumps the black box data out the serial port and the open log device records it to the SD card. And that's all well and good, but it's not as useful as it once was. And the reason is that the speed of this whole process is limited by the speed of the UART. So if we go here in our configurator and we go to the ports tab, I can enable black box on any given UART. And I can set the speed to 250 kilobaud, 250 kbaud at most. That is the fastest that this UART can go. And it turns out that that used to be just about fast enough to log all the data that Blackbox was logging at about a 1 kilohertz rate, 1,000 times per second. You would still occasionally get dropouts where too much data was sent, the buffers filled up, and you would get breakups in the log. But in general, it was usable, and that was fine. But especially with Betaflight uh, 2.9 and 3.0 and 3.01 and going forward, more and more data is being logged, and therefore, you have to log at a slower rate in order to avoid getting dropouts. So if we go here to the black box tab, you can see the logging rate that you select. The default is 2 kilohertz. And you can select whatever logging rate you want. And you might think, well, okay, so 1 kilohertz, I can't log at 1 kilohertz to the open log device. 
maybe I'll log at 667 or 500 hertz. And it turns out that that is slow enough. You, there's a thing called the Nyquist limit and a thing called aliasing. And I have a video about that, which I will uh, give you a link to in the upper right. You can learn more about that. The gist of it is that that is not fast enough to capture meaningful data without distortion. If all you wanted was the stick positions, well, then you could log down at 100 hertz, and updating the stick positions at 100 hertz is still more than fast enough because the sticks don't move that fast. But when we're talking about the gyro data, the gyro data is being updated at a very fast rate, and by only sampling at 500 hertz or 667 hertz, we'll get distortion in the data called aliasing, and the data will not. I'm not going to say it's completely unusable, but it's not, it's not the best. One kilohertz is the minimum that you really want to be logging at if you're doing black box logging on a, on a quadcopter or multi-rotor. And for that reason, I do not feel like the open log device is really viable anymore. Yes, it can get the job done with some caveats, but in general, the fact that you can't log at one kilohertz anymore in Betaflight 29, 30, 301 without a ton of dropouts means that this device, I don't really find it to be to be viable anymore. So what does that leave you? Well, it leaves you the option of an onboard SD card slot, which is what I would recommend. If you're going to be big into black box logging, I strongly advise you to have a flight controller that has an onboard SD card slot. You can log at one kilohertz. You can log at even faster rates. Uh, I'm sure there's an upper, upper end there uh, where you can't log any faster. The SD card itself can't keep up, but you can log pretty fast to an onboard SD card without problems. By the same token, uh, one kilohertz is the lowest you would want to go. Well, it turns out that there, unless you're a developer and you're really digging into the data very deeply, for average troubleshooting and tuning, one kilohertz or maybe two kilohertz is as fast as you really need to go. So there's not much benefit except filling up your SD card faster and, uh, and potentially getting more dropouts to going higher than about one or two kilohertz. I usually set my copters to one kilohertz and just leave it there regardless. The other choice you may have, onboard SD card slot, serial port to an open log device. You may also have the choice to log to an onboard data flash chip. Now, this uh, flight controller doesn't have a data flash chip. If you do have one, it'll be here in the pull down. And the big limitation with a data flash chip is that even the biggest ones are only about 16 megabytes, 128 megabits. And that's enough to hold perhaps, depending on your logging rate, a few minutes, maybe as many as 10 or 20 minutes of data if you really chop the logging rate down. But in general, you get a few minutes of data, a couple batteries, and then it's full, and then that's it. It doesn't do first in, first out queuing. It, it, it will give you the first few minutes of data until it fills up, then it stops logging, and you have to manually erase it. There's another reason why data flash is not my favorite, and that is that it takes a long time, like literally 40 minutes to an hour, to download the full data flash chips worth of data. And the reason is that the serial protocol, the USB protocol used by CleanFlight and Betaflight is not optimized very well. It could be much faster. And in fact, RaceFlight has an improvement that lets it download much faster, I'm told. And uh, there are some pull requests and some ideas in the Betaflight development to let it go faster, but none of those have been implemented yet as far as I know. So if you're coming down off a data flash chip, it's going to take you a long, it's not like you're going to run to your laptop and check the data and then go fly another battery after you tuned. No, you're going to go to your laptop and download the data and then come back an hour from now and then you can look at the data. Uh, but if you don't have an SD card reader on your board, uh, then the, the onboard data flash is better than an open log. You, you would just, you would erase the data flash, you would go fly, you would download the data and go from there. Now you can set up a black box flight mode. And the way that works is when the flight mode is active, black box will be logging. When the flight mode is not active, black box will not log. If you want to know more about setting up flight modes, I have a video about that as well. If you're using an SD card, either via an onboard SD card slot or an open log device, do not bother setting up the black box uh, flight mode because you want black box to be logging all the time. And that's what it'll do if you don't set up the flight mode. It'll just log every time you arm the copter, it'll start logging. And your SD card can hold literally weeks worth of data. So there's no reason to worry about filling it up. You're not going to fill it up. If you have a data flash chip, it might make sense to add a black box flight mode. Uh, and that will allow you to be selective about when you log and when you don't log. However, that does have some complications. Number one, you can not forget to <laughs> turn the logging on. And then you'd be like, oh, darn, I wasn't logging when I thought that I was. The other thing is that it can make it difficult to sync up 
the black box log with flight video. And the reason is that normally the black box log starts at the moment that you arm the copter. And so if you can figure out when your motor started spinning or when your, your, your beeper beeped, it's easy to sync the beginning of the black box log up with that event in your video. But if you could start logging in the middle of your flight because you flipped a switch, syncing that up with video is going to be very difficult. I usually do not use a black box flight mode. I just let it log all the time whenever I arm the copter, even on copters that have a data flash chip. And what that means is that the data flash chip is basically always full and just sitting there waiting for me to erase it. And then if I need to record something, I go into the black box tab and I erase the data flash and then I go fly and I, then I save the data to the file. I have switched to a copter that has an onboard data flash chip. You can see here I'm logging at a very slow rate. This is useless for PID tuning or troubleshooting or almost anything, this, this slow rate. The only thing I'm trying to do here is record my stick positions for a video that I'm making so I can do a sticks overlay. And then, then this low logging rate is useful for that. A few more things I want to say about getting you ready to do this black box logging. One is that black box is actually really intensive on SD cards. SD cards are not made for a lot of very, very small, rapid writes. They're made to write very fast, right? 1080p video is, you know, whatever, 35 megabits per second a class 10 card can write, but it's, it's big chunks of data and they don't come very often. Blackbox is writing a few bytes of data a thousand times a second. And this can overwhelm even a class 10 card because that's not what they're really optimized for. One of the things you can do to uh, improve your odds of getting good logs without a lot of dropouts is to format the card using the SD card formatter utility here. You can download it uh, from the UR here and I'll put it in the video description. This is, I don't know what it does differently, but I'm told, oh no, this is better. You'll get better write performance if you use this. There you go. This is better than just putting it in your Windows machine and just doing right click quick format. The other thing you can do is that there are a few cards that seem to be a better performance for the kind of data that we're doing. I have a video about that, which I'll link to in the upper right and in the video description if you wanna know more about which specific cards you should buy if you wanna maximize your chances of getting good performance with little dropouts when you're doing black box logging. Okay, you're almost ready to go with your black box log analysis. The next thing you're gonna to need to do is go into Chrome. If you don't have your bookmarks toolbar already open, I would suggest uh, right-click Show Bookmarks Bar, and then you should see the apps over here, I believe. It's been so long since I set this up, I kind of don't remember. But if you click Apps, then here are your Chrome apps, and one of those is going to be the Black Box Explorer. You can right-click and do a shortcut and put a shortcut on your toolbar or your Start menu if you so desire. You're going to start that up, and then you will be ready to start doing Black Box Log Analysis. But that's going to be the end of episode one. Episode one is just going to be about getting ready, getting you set up, and giving you the foundation. In episode two, we will actually open up a file and start looking at a file. Thanks for watching. Happy flying.